Um, obviously, we haven't seen what's in the report. Uh, we, 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 uh, neither has the Prime Minister, by all accounts, but senior police officers have seen the evidence that has been uh, collated by uh, Sue Gray. We understand that includes photographs, it includes emails, uh, it includes uh, testimony not just from Number 10 staff and other staff, but also police officers uh, working at Number 10 during these uh, lockdown periods of the last couple of years. Um, do you think it's um, bizarre and questionable that the Metropolitan Police have not investigated until this point. We only had the announcement from Cresta Dick yesterday. Should the police have investigated sooner once we knew of these allegations? Well, from a police point of view, from police procedure, from precedent, I can absolutely understand uh, the reasoning of the Metropolitan Police. These are relatively minor offences, you know, punishable by a fixed penalty ticket. There's no way normally that the police would go back two years to investigate an offence like this. You know, the school rang up today and said, we think a bunch of teachers or a bunch of pupils had a party two years ago in breach of the lockdown legislation. The police absolutely would not be investigating this. Clearly, the weight of public concern, the public mood has been so great that uh, the Met have decided to, uh, they needed to uh, actually uh, intervene and investigate. But in some ways, it won't make it any clearer. I don't think there's going to be any doubt about who was there at any particular time uh, in number 10 or the vicinity. It will be about this difficult dividing line. Uh, when does uh, a works event become a social gathering? The word party is not in the legislation. Uh, the uh, legislation was rushed through. It's got lots of ambiguities. Um, it's vague. It relied on people really observing the spirit of the law. Lots of people were given tickets by the police without any great investigation or explanation or chance to put forward a, a defence. And of course, the irony here really is it's the people who drew up that this legislation who then promoted and publicised it to the public um, and formed the public understanding of what was required. They are now relying on the ambiguities in that legislation um, to evade p uh, potential responsibility. And, and that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because we had lots of, you know, tweets uh, from, you know, Metropolitan Police answering queries to people about what they were allowed to do, were they allowed to gather for work events? And we talk about when does a work event become a social gathering? Um, you weren't allowed to have work events unless it was absolutely 100% necessary for work. I remember the rules at the time, certainly of this June birthday party and very clearly uh, in the December parties as well. They were very, very clear. We were talking about them every day on air. You can go back and look at the rules. They were quite clearly... Uh, uh, Downing Street press conferences made it clear, tweets made it clear. They were, the law, I'm sorry, there was no ambiguity at all. The law made it very clear. They were not allowed. And some workplaces may have been doing it. Well, they were breaking the rules at the time. Um, I've got no issue with that. I think the rules were stupid. However, people making the rules need to obey those rules. Um, and it's very interesting when the Metropolitan Police have said repeatedly, we don't uh, investigate crimes retrospectively. An awful lot of people are wondering if we're in minority report territory and we only sort of John, Tom, Tom, Tom Cruise-like investigate future crimes but yes I mean some of these were a long time ago but they're very vivid memories for a lot of us people who didn't see family members miss child's birthday parties and, and the like um in terms of the investigation how long it will take though um if we Sue Gray's report is basically ready to go if we're going to see that there was some talk that her report couldn't be published until the Metropolitan Police uh, report was uh, finished but of course you can't prejudice a police investigation when there's only a fine that could result from it. No one's going to be dragged through Crown Court uh, for these these uh, failings. So that's not an issue. So that 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 was debunked. But does the Met Police have to sort of start from scratch again? Do or could they use some of the investigation, uh, you know, the the testimony and the evidence that Sue Gray has uh, got brought together herself? They can use quite a lot of the material that she's provided as long as they can show the sort of providence of that. Uh, material. It's really the interviews and interviews given to Sue Gray would have to be uh, repeated under caution under the, you know, the criminal investigation uh, procedure. Um, and I, you know, I would say, Julia, the trouble is we are dealing here with the criminal law um, and what you may think and what was, as I say, promoted within press conferences and on tweets and, and uh, explanations from media organisations about what were the rules the officers have to go back to what did the legislation actually say um, and these difficulty about the definitions and the fact that there are not lots of stated cases and past history as to how courts have looked in this in, in, in the past. And this is really where their difficulty is going to be. Yeah. You know, hypocrisy is not an offence under the criminal law. Uh, the public mood is really, really clear 
on this. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, the police can't uh, take this forward. I can't take many people forward to a fixed penalty ticket because of the ambiguities in the legislation. I think there's going to be enormous frustration. And, and, you know, inevitably, almost the police are going to get some blame for this as somehow there being one rule for one and one for another. Yeah. But this is the issue, isn't it? I mean, 120,000 people did face uh, these uh, these fines. Um, and we know that in the cases where people have faced the biggest fines, you know, 10,000 pounds organising a party, a lot of those actually, when they get taken to uh, to court and people actually challenge them, as opposed to the fixed fine of 100 pounds or whatever, um, actually these cases have fallen because of the ambiguities in the law. And, and we, we've even had this, whether it's masks in classrooms or not, it's not the law, it's not mandated, it's a guideline. Should you follow the guideline? Should you follow the We talked about, you know, the spirit of the law, the law, rules, guidelines, advice. It's all been very confused. And it did put the police in a very difficult situation. I mean, sometimes we had police overstepping the mark. I mean, I still vividly remember video of police telling parents off for their children playing in their own front garden. I mean, that's quite absurd, uh, failing by those officers. But police were put in a very difficult position where they were basically having to go up to law-abiding citizens sitting on a park bench or walking, carrying a coffee three miles from their home, um, that they were breaking the law. Um, this is this has massively damaged the relationship between ordinary law-abiding citizens and the police, hasn't it? I, I think it has to, to some extent. I mean, there's been lots of other issues, as we know, uh, affecting the police over the, yeah. the past year. I think the crucial thing, though, Julia, in, in, in general, is that most people absolutely observe the regulations. Most people mm. cooperated with the police. Most people, when they were told you're going to get a fixed penalty ticket, accepted that, didn't challenge it, didn't want to go through the whys and wherefores, accepted that this was a matter, in a way, of public shame and the fact that we were all in this together and we were all trying to protect each other and the National Health Service. And that's clearly where... Uh, the public, you know, frustration has come from. And there'll be enormous frustration also amongst uh, individual police officers, as you say, that had to enforce this, had to try and make sense of rush legislation, who tried to do what the public and the government wanted of them. Um, and as I say, now placed in this invidious position. And as you say, by having, you know, confidence in them question. And as well, Julia, you know, longer term, after all this has blown, blown or, you know, gone on, um, the fact is that damage to confidence will be there and more and more people will say, well, I won't follow the law or the, yep. the land. You know, I will make my own decision about what is right. There's one rule for one. So it is actually the damage to the, the wider issue of public confidence in the law generally, law enforcement, yeah. the criminal justice process, which is you know going to affect all of us. Indeed, yeah. We have policing by consent. Uh, it, it basically relies on the vast majority of people accepting and following the law um, so that the police can deal with those who do not. Um, really good to talk to you. Sir Peter Fahey, he's a former chief constable of Greater Manchester Police. 